So let's start by taking stock of what we saw at the end of the first episode. First of all, we saw the rising and decreasing levels of CO2 during the year. So what's that all about? Well, some climate change deniers believe that we are simply too small to have a large effect on the Earth's atmosphere. All the CO2 that we pump into the air, it's not enough to have an effect. But what we can actually see here is the effect of photosynthesis, trees taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to be used as energy. Now obviously photosynthesis is more active in the summer because plants and trees have more leaves during the summer. So this is why the levels of carbon dioxide in the northern hemisphere start dropping during the summer months and then the CO2 levels begin to rise again during the later months when the trees have less leaves and are performing less photosynthesis. And the opposite is seen in the southern hemisphere because as you know, in the southern hemisphere, winter is summer and summer is winter. We can see this in the CO2. The trees are actually photosynthesizing at different rates in the north and south hemisphere. Meaning as the northern hemisphere rates rise, the southern hemisphere rates fall. But you might think that humans can't be having an effect on the Earth's atmosphere. But every single year, it is clear to see that the trees are having an effect. The same cycle continues every year. The only difference is the average levels of atmospheric CO2 continue to rise and rise. And if it's not humans causing it, then where's it coming from? The second major point here was again what we saw in the Vostok ice core. If you remember the temperature graph where we discussed before that in most cases the Earth was much colder than it is today, while having interglacial peaks every say 100,000 years or so, and that we were in one of those peaks right now. And we saw a very similar pattern with the CO2 data, generally a lot lower, rising to peaks every 100,000 years. And there is the comparison chart. Temperature in red, CO2 in blue. The correlation is very, very clear. And again, when superimposed, we see CO2 and temperature tracking very closely. Just look at what has happened recently though. But sticking with this, in actual fact, in closer inspection, it was discovered that the temperature rise happened first. As the ice ages were coming to an end, the temperature rose first, followed by a rise in carbon dioxide. Now obviously the global warming proponents, their entire claim is that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is causing the temperature rise. But what we saw in the ice cores was the opposite. The temperature rose first, followed by the rise in carbon dioxide. Now obviously this data was met with great enthusiasm by climate change deniers, who of course claimed that this was proof that carbon dioxide was not responsible for the current increase in atmospheric temperature. And there were many articles, many scientists claiming this was a nail in the coffin for the proponents of global warming. But in actual fact, carbon dioxide following temperature rise makes perfect sense. And this was actually predicted back in 1990, almost 30 years ago, in a paper by Laureus. Essentially, what is happening here is, if you remember when I talked about the Earth's orbit affecting ice ages, so for example, the further away we are from the sun, the colder the planet will be. It's not just based on that, it's also based on the actual tilt of the Earth too. But it goes in a cycle, and at the beginning of every cycle, for example, when the temperature starts to rise, this occurs due to the change in orbit and the change in actual tilt when the planet starts to heat up. And what happens when the planet starts to heat up? Well, first of all, the ice starts to melt. And we already know what is held in the ice, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Even more importantly, as the oceans begin to heat up, they also give off more carbon dioxide. We can see here that when water is heated, the carbon dioxide is driven out. And you can check this by using two cans of soda. The warmer can will fizz more when opened because it is letting off more CO2. The same thing happens in the ocean as the oceans are heated, adding more CO2 to the atmosphere. And as more CO2 is added to the atmosphere, the Earth gets warmer. And as the Earth gets warmer, the poles continue to melt, releasing more CO2 into the atmosphere, and the Earth gets warmer. And this is why the rise in carbon dioxide appears to lag the rise in temperature. What's actually happening is, there is an initial rise in temperature from the changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun and the axial tilt but this initial rise in temperature, which starts melting the ice and starts heating the oceans, causes carbon dioxide to be released into the atmosphere, which then begins a feedback loop, causing the temperatures to rise and rise and rise over a hundred thousand years. So far from being a nail in the coffin of global warming, it actually adds to the evidence of what we are seeing today. Now, a lot of climate deniers point to periods in the past. For example, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, which happened 56 million years ago, 
This is one of the hottest periods in Earth's history, and the average temperature rose almost 6 degrees over a period of about 20,000 years. In fact, we think it was maybe 6 degrees over 10,000 years, or maybe even 8 degrees over a period of 10,000 years. And this was the most rapid documented warming in the past. So let's be generous and say 8 degrees over 10,000 years. That would be 0.8 of a degree over a thousand years. And yet the numbers I used from NASA earlier, we saw it was over one degree in not much over a hundred years. So compared to this hot event that some climate change deniers use as a reasoning for why global warming isn't man-made, the fact is, comparatively, right now the Earth is heating almost ten times faster than during this thermal maximum period. And this is one of the simplest points. Proponents of global warming never claimed that the Earth wasn't hotter in the past. And they never claimed that the Earth didn't cycle between hotter and colder periods. But one of the claims has been that the rate of change, the rate of change in the temperature has increased to a level that has rarely have ever been seen before in the history of the Earth. The figures go between 5 and 10 times faster. Based on our temperature records of the past 100 years, and especially from the past 50 years, from maybe around the 1970s, we are heating up the Earth at an unprecedented rate. From the geological record, we can see that there were times in the past where the Earth did heat up at the same kind of speed. But these rapid warmings appear to have been the result of catastrophic change. For example, mega volcanoes eruptions and that kind of thing. And another important thing here about this Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum was that our current rate of carbon release to the atmosphere is almost 10 times higher than the highest rate during this time, which suggests that we are altering our environment in an unprecedented and unpredictable way. It's true there were also times in the past where levels of carbon dioxide were far, far higher than what they are today. But this was a gradual change taking place over millions of years, giving the ecosystem time to adapt. One obvious example of this would be during the Carboniferous period of between 300 million and 350 million years ago. At some parts of this, levels of carbon were double what they are today, 800 parts per million. Atmospheric oxygen was also 50% higher as well. The reason for this was the Earth was blanketed in swamps and trees, so the trees could take in a lot more of the carbon dioxide and give it off as oxygen. Obviously, photosynthesis is when the trees take the carbon in and respiration is giving off oxygen and also carbon dioxide. The difference here was this took millions, tens of millions of years for the Earth to evolve to this state. And temperatures are the same as what they are today. So how is that possible? All that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and yet the temperature remained the same, which is another argument used by global warming deniers. The difference here is, 350 million years ago, the sun was releasing less energy. The sun is like any other star. As it gets older, it gets hotter. 300 million years ago, the sun would be giving off less energy, so the earth would be colder anyway. As you can see, it's not always as simple as looking at the numbers. The problem we have here today though, is that the sun is older, the sun is giving off more energy, and all these dead trees from the Carboniferous period, the coal that we are burning today, releasing into the atmosphere, is not being taken up by the trees, it is not being turned into oxygen in the way that it was back then. The big, big problem we have today is, we are in a feedback loop where we release more of this carbon back into the atmosphere, but there aren't enough trees to deal with it. And we can see the results of this because the ice caps are shrinking. You remember the first slide where we saw that some solar radiation is reflected by the Earth and the atmosphere. And I mentioned that clouds could reflect solar rays. Something else reflects solar rays, and that is ice. In particular, the polar ice caps. This one's simple to understand. Lighter materials reflect light, darker materials absorb light. That's why people wear white t-shirts during warmer days instead of black ones. But if the ice caps are melting, and the ice caps are melting, then that is even less solar rays reflected away from the Earth, which means even more infrared radiation being absorbed by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which causes more heat, which causes more melting of the polar caps. What we are doing to the Earth is not natural. This is not a natural event. This is caused by us putting the carbon in the Earth back into the air where it shouldn't be. 